So today we're welcoming Dr. Abigail Law, who's going to be talking about the Nature Overheard Project, which is all about acoustic monitoring for insects through community science. And she's going to talk us through the setup of the project, where it's at now, and what we can expect in the future. So over to you, Abby. Thank you, Kieran. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for taking time out of your day to come and uh, watch this talk. Hopefully, you'll be interested in um, the project and uh, how you can get involved. Um, so as uh, Kieran sort of mentioned, I um, have just recently um, come to finish working on this project. Um, so I was a community science officer at the Natural History Museum. Um, and I've just taken up a new role at UK, UKCH, so the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. But this project is still um, running, so I'm happy to get you all to come and contribute. So um, the Centre for UK Nature is based in the Natural History Museum. Some of you might have heard of it, and probably a lot of you might not have. Um, the Centre for UK Nature is um, a sort of public facing arm of the museum and it's all about getting people involved um, with the research and the collections that we have at the museum. Um, so all about building agency to act for nature based on sound scientific evidence and learning theories. So we have five sort of arms of the uh, centre and one of that is an identification and advisory service. So if you're local to London, you can bring in um, some specimens or um, some, we often get fossils and bones and things like that. And you can bring it to the team and they can help you to identify it. We also run a um, NHM UK Biodiversity Facebook page where people post photos of um, pretty much any wildlife that they've seen and the experts are, it's about 15,000 members on there and uh, people can help you identify them. We've got a UK biodiversity reference collection in the centre, so uh, people can come in and book out a space to use the microscopes and compare maybe some of the specimens that they've caught uh, to the reference collection that we have. And we've got things like photo stacking cameras as well. So again, if you're local to London, those are facilities that you should really um, try and um, make use of. We do UK natural history training in the workshop. Um, we're involved in nature recovery science and the thing that I'm going to talk um, about today is community science, um, which is a, a very important part of the centre. So the centre's work is all about supporting people to develop skills, knowledge and the capacity to take practical science led action in support of the UK's nature. Um, so a project that the museum has been running for the last few years that the centre is very involved with is the Urban Nature Project. Now, if you've been to the south site at South Kensington over the last 18 months, well, two years, you might have seen all of the yellow hoarding, which is up all around the site. Now, that's related to the Urban Nature Project. And it's a um, heritage lottery uh, funded project, which is all about connecting people in urban environments to, um, to nature. As we know, most of the UK population actually live in urban areas, but these are some of the um, population some of the um, people that have the lowest sort of connection to nature. So we're trying to um, fix that really. And we're trying to create a movement for urban nature. And that the biggest sort of part of that urban nature project is the redesign of the gardens at South Kensington. So there's a five acre site there and we're creating a uh, accessible biodiverse um, green space in the center of London. Uh, we're also undertaking scientific research both at the site uh, in South Kensington and at partner museums across the UK. So that's through the traditional uh, monitoring that we've been doing for over 25 years um, uh, sort of observations. And now we're supplementing those observations with um, eDNA work and also acoustics. And we're spreading out that work to partner sites across the UK. We're creating networks of um, people that are interested in urban ecology and work in urban nature. So there's a new urban nature network, um, which is available for you to join uh, if you are interested in urban nature. 
Um, there's going to be an on-site learning program with a classroom where people can get involved, lots of training opportunities. Um, and then the uh, branch of the Urban Nature Project, which is related to um, Nature Over Here, comes under, is the National Learning and Community Science Programme. And this is all about creating advocates for the planet, which is a key um, a part of the museum's work. So as I mentioned, uh, the gardens at South Kensington are getting completely transformed. Um, I thought I had to show you a little bit um, about what that's going to look like. Um, so if you do um, are fortunate enough to, to ever visit, uh, this is what it's going to look like in just a couple of months time as you uh, enter the, um, the site from the South Kensington tube station. And it's going to be a journey through time. Um, so sort of talking about the evolution of life uh, with lots of ferns and cycads as you begin. You can see in there in a nice bronze um, cast of uh, Dippy the Diplodocus into then a more uh, representative uh, picture of what we see today uh, in nature. So meadows, wildlife garden, um, the new nature discovery garden. And also the activity centre. This is going to provide year round learning, um, both for school groups and natural history groups. Um, it can be booked out. Um, so there'll be lots going on around the site. We've also depaved the Darwin Centre courtyard um, to show how you can have positive interventions. Um, and those are going to be full of uh, vegetable uh, pots and beds that we've been working with community, local community groups with. Um, so the yeah the the site is going to be completely transformed and uh, really looking forward to that opening up in the next couple of months as i mentioned we are sort of upscaling the monitoring that we're doing at the site um we have a long history of monitoring wildlife at the um, museum and now we've input a sensor network so it's going to be um, monitoring all sorts of um, environmental um uh things like temperature and humidity and we've got acoustic sensors and we're also doing monthly malaise trapping um to sample uh, edna for um different invertebrates so we can find out more about what's on our site and this is just a picture of all of those sensors across the site um so they're going to have long-term monitoring and we're going to be looking at how um, the different sort of uh, the creation of the habitats and restoration of the site has had an impact on biodiversity and we're hoping to invite other researchers to come in and maybe test some of their um, acoustics work or, or other biodiversity work um, so we can support research across the site. Now back to the National Learning and Community Science Programme um, that we are all here today to hear about. What is community science then? So I've talked a little bit about it. You might have heard of it. You might be a bit more familiar with the term citizen science. Um, so we at the museum, uh, we use the terms community science, but community science or citizen science, um, both are, they mean the same thing. And uh, community science is all about getting the public involved in scientific research. So as you can imagine, answering big and important scientific questions needs a lot of data. Um, and often scientists are sort of restricted in how they can collect this data. Um, that might be due to resources, it might be geographic restrictions, might be time restrictions. And so getting more people involved in collecting this data um, enables uh, scientists to answer bigger questions than they might not have been able to um, had they just been um, reliant on themselves. And the benefits of uh, community science for participants are that they can get involved in the scientific process. They can understand more about you know, what, it, what it means to, to answer a scientific research question um, and they can develop their skills as well. And they can find out things that they might not have um, been you know, exposed to previously. And community science is a priority research theme at the museum. Um, it has the program has been running for about ten years now, and um, yeah, it's been very successful, and uh, it's um, yeah going from strength to strength. So some of our other um, community science projects that we have running at the museum at the moment are the National Education Nature Park. 
um, which is a um, huge five-year project run by um, the Department for Education. And the aim is that every nursery school and college in England will really get to know their, um, the biodiversity on their site. So they'll be undertaking baseline surveys um, to figure out what biodiversity is there. They'll be implementing um, uh, interventions. Um, so creating meadows, putting up uh, bird boxes and things like that. And then they'll also be monitoring um, the change in biodiversity through time. So that's a fantastic project and it's had a, a loads of sign up so far. Nature Over Here, obviously, as I'm going to speak about a bit more today, um, that's all about looking at the impact of noise pollution on insects. We've also got Gene Pools, um, which is, again, England only uh, project run by uh, DEFRA. And that is about uh, sampling pond water from cities um, and using eDNA to identify the biodiversity in ponds. We also have Big Seaweed Search, uh, which has been running for a few years now, and that is about monitoring seaweeds um, across the coastline, working with one of our um, museum researchers. So the aims of the Mass Community Science Project at the museum as part of the Urban Nature Project were to involve audiences in all stages of the project. So not just data collection, but the development of the project um, and even hopefully they can get involved in some of the analysis too. And the reason why we wanted to do that was we wanted to provide a range of opportunities for people to participate, no matter what their skills or their experience was. And again, um, by giving them, you know, uh, a real understanding of the whole scientific process. We wanted to um, give young people a sense of empowerment by um, designing this project around in causes that they were interested in. Um, so really finding out what young people are interested in, uh, what they um, want to know about the urban nature and yeah, how we can gather data to, to answer questions surrounding that. So the Nature Over Here programme is a pretty um, big programme, which is split into multiple tiers of engagement. So that, as I said, um, no matter what people's level of skill or, or experience or how much time they have to commit, they can get involved in some way. So hopefully all of you today will um, be able to see a way that you can get involved. Um, and we have a huge target of participants that we are aiming to um, engage with over the two years. Um, and so they're broken down into these tiers, which I'll talk about. So tier one, we're aiming to engage 45,000 participants at. These are sort of low level um, activities that people can get involved with um, either in person or on social media and their engagement with the project, um, finding out more about you know, the subject area of interest. So in this case, insects, you know, road impacts um, and uh, noise pollution. Tier two is a bit more uh, contribution to community science, but low commitment. So things like iNaturalist activities, um, Zooniverse activities, where there is a scientific, um, there is their, their input is, does have scientific value, but it's not, um, doesn't require a lot of time or commitment. And we're aiming to engage 30,000 people with this uh, tier. Then we have tier three, which is the main focus of the programme. So that is the activity where people can get involved with an activity which takes about 30 minutes to an hour, um, depending on uh, whether you're doing it alone or in a group and that gathers data to answer the research question that we're focused on. So in this case, it's um, how does road noise impact insects? And I'll talk a bit more about that in the next few slides. And we're aiming to engage 5,000 people with this activity. And then tier four are those uh, participants that were involved in the development of the programme. Um, and what you'll find is that the um, number of participants that we're uh, hoping to engage with as we go through the project um, decreases. As you may expect, um, it's a lot easier to engage people with sort of lower level activities. Um, but the aim is that they will be 
exposed to and feel like they've developed some skill and experience to be able to move them on to the next tier. So how did Nature of Yard come to be? I mentioned there's a national learning programme as part of the Urban Nature Project and that's called Explore Urban Nature where we work with partner museums uh, around uh, the UK in the Real World Science Network to deliver workshops um, all to do with urban nature. And as part of these workshops, and we had an online um, call out, we asked students to submit research questions that they were interested in exploring. Um, and as you can imagine, we had a whole range of uh, questions submitted. So these students were 11 to 14 years old. Um, lots of these questions were quite broad. Um, they really think outside the box. Um, some were more scientific than others. So these needed to really be narrowed down into things which um, were feasible to run as a um, community science project. And also uh, questions which we, we knew we could potentially uh, gather data to be able to, to answer. And what we did was we worked to narrow down those all of those hundreds of questions that were submitted into three that had um, some sort of um, scope to be to be used. We then ran um, a workshop with scientists at the museum where we delved a little bit more into those questions, those three questions. We were thinking about what sort of methods can be used. Um, uh, and then we decided on the one of the questions, which was how can we make roads better for nature? Now, this question was submitted by a group of year eights from a school in Cambridgeshire named St Ivo Academy. And what we did then was we took this question back to the students that had submitted it. Um, we took some of the scientists from the museum and we ran some core design workshops with these students. And we really wanted to find out what sort of things they were interested in. So when they talk about nature on roads, what sort of taxonomic groups are they thinking of? What sort of animals or plants do they know about? And also what impacts of roads are they aware of? And um, this was sort of one of my first experiences of going into school and working with students in this sort of way. And the, the other scientists that joined myself and my colleague Farida in, in delivering these workshops, they, they all said that they were very um, interested in what the students had to say, and it wasn't really what we had anticipated. So I was expecting them to, to obviously know about pollution and maybe litter and things like that, which you typically, I remember being taught at a school. But some of the things that they were coming up with, like noise pollution um, and light pollution, um, there was all sorts that we really wouldn't have considered that they would know much about. Um, so what we did was we worked with them to come up with a series of questions, um, of scientific questions that they had um, put forward. And then um, we did a very rapid literature review because of course there's no point running a um, big community science project if someone else is already working on, on this. So we did a rapid literature review and um, identified that the sort of the question with the most promise was how does noise pollution affect insects and at that point then we brought on ed baker who is an acoustic biology researcher at the museum as uh, he is he bringing him on has enabled us to to understand the the methods of how we were going to answer this question so why do animals make noise um you might have some ideas about why that is there's, there's quite a few answers. So often it's to communicate, um, so to signal that they are um, in a, a position, um, maybe to, to announce that there's a predator um, nearby that they need to warn off. Um, they often use it to, to mate. Um, so for example, the uh, grasshoppers, they rub their uh, hind legs against their wings uh, in a process called stridulation to create a noise and they use that in um, sort of courtship. Um, and then the crickets do similar, but they rub their wings together. And though most people, when they think about insects making noise, they will think of um, grasshoppers and crickets. But some animals also use noise um, to navigate. 
as a form of defense, as I said, uh, maybe to warm to to warn off uh, a predator. And also they can make incidental noises. So for example, um, bumblebees, they um, take part in uh, something called buzz pollination sometimes when they need to remove the pollen from um, the the flower. Um, they sort of beat their, their wings rapidly together and this makes a buzzing noise. Um, and that's just happenstance of, of what um, is what is happening. So what is the what do we know about the impact of road noise on insects? So we know that um, anthropogenic noise or human made noise can cause behavioral and physiological changes in animals. But not a lot is understood about what the impact is on insects. So obviously insects live in all sorts of environments. Um, often roads are built um, through natural habitats and so the insects will um, continue to live just on the side of the roads um, or maybe flying through. Um, there has been a study in which was uh, published in 20, it was actually 2014, not 2012, um, where they showed that grasshoppers, which are in noisy habitats, actually change their song compared to those which are found in quiet habitats. Now, the analogy that I quite often like to, to use to give people a bit of an understanding about why this might be is um, when if you're at a busy uh, restaurant or a bar or something and you often have to raise your voice in order to be heard. Um, we imagine that the insects and, and other animals are doing similar. There's also a study which um, came out uh, that showed that birds also do similar. So they will change their song um, in urban environments. So Nature Over Heard is the first study to look at the impact of um, not road noise um, on insects at scale in the UK. So the programme itself, you can find out on the, the website all of the things I'm going to talk about today, um, all of the activities and how you can get involved are on the, the Nature of You page. But the main survey um, you can find if you just scroll down and click on ways to take part, you'll see the nature overheard survey. So I'll just talk through exactly what that involves and how we're collecting data to answer this question. So the nature overheard survey is a tier three activity. As I mentioned, this is sort of the, the most involved activity as uh, in the programme. And it involves a uh, small short survey which we recommend takes about half an hour but if you get really familiar with it um, like I was last year you can probably get it done in about 20 minutes um, or if you are taking part in a really big group um, we suggest to um, set aside about an hour for it and then what we want you to do is to pick a 10 meter by 2 meter area near the road to survey now, this doesn't have to be right on the edge of the road, um, you know, because there's obviously some safety um, considerations there. As long as it's within 10 metres of the road, it can be in a, a more sheltered space like a park or a garden. Once you've uh, identified your survey area, uh, we'd like you to answer some questions about the weather conditions uh, and your survey area. So, for example, um, what sort of plants are present in your survey area? Then we are asking people to record audio for five minutes in the center of the survey area. Now this can be done with a mobile phone, um, or an iPad or a more of a traditional dictaphone, any uh, device that can record audio. After the audio recording is done, uh, we would like you to walk through the survey area and take note of any insects that you find. Now, don't worry, we're not asking people to identify, um, you know, species um, or insects to that much uh, detail. What we're asking people to do is to identify insects to about order level, which is uh, groups of insects. Um, so we have bees and wasps, we have ants separately, um, and then we have butterflies and moths, grasshoppers and crickets, um, true bugs, beetles, hoverflies and other flies. Now, if you have never identified insects in your life, that's absolutely fine. We are asking, we're encouraging people actually to take photos of what they see. 
Um, Because although we're only asking people to identify insects to order level, if you snap a photo, then we can um, verify what that um, insect is. And maybe we can even get it to species level, depending what it is. So we can get more information out of those photos. Then all of that data is submitted onto an online recording form. And each audio recording counts as a single data submission. So on the um, Nature Overheard page that I uh, mentioned is the um, survey protocol, and that's available both in English and in Welsh. Um, so yeah, not sure if we have any Welsh speakers on the call, um, but yeah, that's fully available. And if you, um, once you read the protocol, if you're quite comfortable with it, and it's pretty straightforward protocol, um, but it's been designed in a booklet um, to, to be used by whoever, um, there's also a simplified recording form that can be used. So if you want to repeat the survey, um, it's much easier than to print out the whole protocol again. So how are we using the audio recordings to answer this question that we have? So as I mentioned, all of this acoustics work is led by Ed Baker, um, who is the acoustic biology researcher. And his research uses artificial intelligence to analyze these audio recordings. And what the um, AI does is it recognizes patterns in the sounds and that can be used to identify changes in behavior. So for example, um, it can, uh, the imagine a, uh, a bumblebee is buzzing away in your recording and there's no sound of, of much else, but then a car drives past. Does the bumblebee just continue to do as it was doing, making the exact same noise, or has it stopped for a second? How long does it take for that buzzing to continue? Obviously, the buzzing that it makes isn't necessarily um, being used to communicate, but we can get an idea of how that noise of the, um, the surrounding environment is impacting um, the behavior. And the end goal is for us to use all of these audio recordings in order to train algorithms to identify insects from uh, recordings. So we can do it with um, birds. So you might be familiar with the Merlin Bird ID app, and that's where you take an audio recording of um, a bird song. And there's AI um, built within that app that can enable you to um, find out what species it is. Um, there's lots of people working on being able um, to use that technology for um, all sorts of different animal groups, um, but it's still a, very much a work in progress for insects. And the key with anything to do with AI is more data is key. So we absolutely need to collect as many recordings as we can, ideally from all sorts of different environments across the UK in order for us to build a better picture of um, what is going on. Another activity which is part of the programme is Flytunes. So Flytunes is a Zooniverse activity. Now, if you're not familiar with the Zooniverse platform, that is a digital, um, it's an, it's a, it's, an, it's a website where you can take part in community science digitally. So no matter where you are, um, you don't even need to be in the UK. In fact, it's an American uh, platform. You can take part in community science uh, in the UK and around the world. And what we've done with Flytunes is we've taken the audio recordings that were collected in 2023. We have um, snipped them all down into six second clips which you can imagine is a lot of files, thousands and thousands, and thousands of files. And what we're asking people to do is to listen to those six second clips and tell us what they can hear in those clips. So can they hear cars or vans? Can they hear trains or planes? Maybe some birds, insects, uh, humans, or um, if they just don't know, they can, um, they can say that. And um, this launched, it was the, in the middle of February and we put up, I think it was about 12,000 files um, and uh, everyone flew through them very, very quickly. Um, but we're just working on um, uploading another batch of files um, to, to, get, um, to get through. So each file has to be um, we have set a retirement limit of uh, seven classifications. So seven different people have to listen to the same clip um, in order for us to, to mark the file as sort of finished. 
Um, so we're not relying on just the, the opinion of one person. We're going to use all of that information in order to see if we can train um, a computer to identify when there are different um, noises being made. So yeah, watch the space for um, fly tunes and hopefully more data will be going up in the next week and you can get involved with that. Oh, sorry. Um, there's also some other sort of light touch um, quizzes and activities. So we've got a what's that insect uh, quiz where we're trying to gather data about how um, easy or difficult people find identifying different insect groups. So it's a very short um, quiz, but we're really interested uh, to find out whether people can tell uh, how common is it that people can identify a butterfly as a butterfly, um, maybe a, a bit more likely than being able to identify a, a true bug or a beetle. So definitely get involved um, with the quiz because it's all really important data for us to be able to find out a little bit more about um, people's perceptions and, and skills of, of insects. So yeah, that's just the, the quiz there for you. We also run an iNaturalist activity as part of Nature Over Here uh, called Street Safari. This ran in October of last year. It was a partnership with Living Streets, which is a walk to school charity. And during October, it was International Walk to School Month. So we partnered with them to try and encourage people to um, uh, observe and record wildlife um, or near their near roads um, when they were walking to school or even walking to work or um, the park or anything like that. And that resulted in over a thousand observations of wildlife across the UK near roads, um, which was really cool to, to see. Obviously during October there wasn't many insects about, but we did have some some nice things in there like the IUBB, um, which does have a, a late um, flight season um, and lots of other invertebrates, but as you can imagine, plenty of plants. And then we also have the uh, nature sounds quiz. Again, just light touch activity where we're asking people to listen to some sounds of animals and tell us what they think it is. Um, and again, these the, all of these activities are getting people to think about, um, you know, distinguishing different sounds. How does a human do it? That might be the same or different to how a computer does it. Um, and this is all building their awareness of acoustics research um, and the, the main research question. So back to the Nature Over Here survey and how that went in 2023. So the Nature Over Here was launched as a project in April 2023 and the survey ran from March to October, sorry, no, ran from April to October last year. It runs from March to October this year. Um, and 846 people got involved from across the UK. Um, they took 369 photos and 668 minutes of audio w was recorded. The number of insects that they identified is still to be confirmed. Um, I have gone through all of those photos and identified them to at least order um, level, which was what we were we were asking people to do. Um, and in some places I've been able to take that further, but um, I do not know every single um, insect. So some of the, the other groups uh, that I'm less familiar with um, will be verified by other experts. Um, and so, yeah, we're hoping to get an idea of, of those records very soon. Um, I'll undoubtedly have a question about this, um, but all of those records, those biological records, um, will eventually make their way uh, to the NBN, which is the National Biodiversity Network. Um, we're just working out the, the flow of data. Um, but my map is actually covered on my screen, but um, you'll be able to see that we did get a really uh, good spread of data points throughout the UK. Um, and this was without really doing a lot of targeted work, you can see that most of the points fall um, in London, which is to be expected. Um, but I don't know um, if anybody's got, you know, very keen eyes or they live there, you'll be able to see that we do have a data point right up in Orkney, which I was pretty impressed with. But we do have some big 
gaps. So we didn't have any submissions from Northern Ireland. We didn't have any from the northeast of England. And we do have other gaps. So, for example, we've got East Anglia there, North Wales, huge parts of Scotland. Um, there will obviously be um, the 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 population will affect the, the data points, but um, yeah, we can we can definitely do better in other parts of the UK. So if you can see your area there in the UK um, and it doesn't have a, a point on the map, definitely get involved this year. Um, and even if it does have a map, even if you live in London, um, with the data that you collect in London is still completely valuable um, and it will all be used to, to answer the, the questions. So these are just some of the photos um, out of the, that 300 or so, which was submitted. Um, you can see lots of variety of, of different insects. Um, we had a harlequin um, ladybird emerging, actually. It was quite a, a nice um, set of photos there. Um, we've got brimstone butterfly, marmalade hoverfly, um, a taupe flax, brocard moth, meadow grasshopper, red-tailed bumblebee, and um, a narcissus bulb fly there. So that's just um, showing you yeah, some of the records that we've been able to, to collect as part of this project. And then I know this is a talk about insects, um, but just bear with me um, for um, a moment. So we were able to take the audio recordings uh, that were collected um, during 2023, and a really um, basic bit of analysis that we can do, we know we can do straight away, is to run that through the um, pipeline to identify bird species. So as I um, mentioned previously, that um, technology is, is, has been, people have been working on this for quite a number of years. And so it's pretty, um, it's well set up to, to work. And through, through that, um, we were able to identify birds in each audio recording um, and what we do is uh, every time the AI identifies a bird we only um, take into account those identifications that are over 85% um, confidence so um, those that's sort of our threshold and if we take that into consideration then um, we will see that only five birds were um, present in over 10% of the audio recordings. 26% um, of audio recordings had a uh, magpie, 12% had the wood pigeon, wren and robin, 11% uh, with jackdaw. And then I was going to stop at 10% and over, but I thought that the, the bird, which was at 9%, um, was really interesting because uh, this is the rose-ringed parakeet, um, which uh, if if you know, uh, isn't exactly a widespread um, bird across the UK um, and probably is being um, weighted by the number of um, recordings that we had in London. So the the plan, you know, very, very long term plan is um, to be able to, to do this sort of thing with um, insects. So what's for 2024? As I said, we really like everyone to get involved, no matter where they are in the UK. And also, um, no matter if you're in an urban environment or rural area, um, it's all data and it's all going to be valuable uh, in order to answer the research question. The aim is to collect a thousand recordings from across 12 regions of the UK. As I said, we've hit 10 regions so far, but I'm pretty sure we can get a point on the map in Northern Ireland and the northeast of England this year. Uh, so we've got some regional targets and we're going to be working with um, partner in partnership with organisations and museums across the UK to deliver workshops in order for us to reach those regional targets. So as I mentioned, what we're sort of working towards, this is really just a, a whistle stop uh, tour of where we're at at the moment. And there's there's a lot more to go, but the main aim of the talk was to, to try and get all of you enthused and, and wanting to know more and to contribute to the project. But the, the goal is to combine this uh, Nature Over Here data set with the wider acoustic monitoring, which is being done as part of the Urban Nature Project. So with the sensors that we've got in the garden, we're having uh, audio recordings 20, 24 seven. Um, and we can also use the Flytunes classifications to train machine learning algorithms to identify insects. 
We can then combine um, this information with the reference library that we have at the Museum of uh, Acoustic um, Records. So we have specimens where we have got a sound recording of that specimen making noise and it's attached to a specific specimen in the collection. Um, so a lot, as you can imagine, of orthoptera, so grasshoppers and crickets and cicadas. But there are some bees and flies and things like that in the reference library as well. Because if we do want to get species level identification, we do obviously need to combine that with um, a reference of that species. And acoustics is a growing area of research. So not only if you collect the data now, we can use it to answer the questions that we're interested in now, but also in the future, there's going to be so much more that we can do with um, with acoustics. So the idea is to collect as much um, information as we can now. And then as we as technology and as ideas advance, we can answer more and more questions as time goes by. So how have we got how far have we got towards that 80,000 participants? So we actually engaged with over 56,000 participants um, so far, the program, um, which is fantastic. Um, so we've been doing lots of events where we're telling people about the project. We're running activities, um, getting people to identify um, specimens. Um, we've got an acoustics activity where people um, link up bird sounds to their descriptions that have been described. Um, again, trying to get people to think about how to identify sounds, um, get some thinking about how acoustic research works. So um, it would be great uh, to, to be able to, to smash that 80,000 target by the end of this year. So the final sort of call to action from me really is to get involved. Um, as I said, the main part of the Nature of Year programme is the survey. Um, and probably the thing that you guys, if you're interested um, sort of in, in insects themselves and recording them um, will be most of most interest to you is to go out and uh, yeah you can do this alone you can do it with a friend in a group um there are some weather conditions to meet but um there's it's not that that complex really um yeah we just we want to get as many people involved from from everywhere really so yeah that's just um that's it and i just wanted to say none of this would be possible um without the rest of my colleagues um that make it possible um so ed baker jess wardlow lucy robinson Fried atwan freya stannard and also many 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 more people at the museum which i would not have the space to to write them all um the scientists that were involved in the co-design workshops the digital team that help us with um getting all of these resources and things available comms um this really has been um a true uh com collaboration of teams at the museum and it's been one of the first times that teams across the museum have worked together so closely so it's been it's been really brilliant project to to work on and i was yeah really sad to to hand it over um to to have a new role but yeah and there's some information about the funders as well so uh, heritage lottery and other lead sponsors and donors that have made this possible and that's the end of my talk. So hopefully there'll be some questions in the chat that I can that I can answer.